There's a lot to be said for looking forward as opposed to kind of, you know, looking back. If you get to a point in your life where I used to play football or I used to go to, I used to be fit and then I had kids and then I had this and then I had It's quite a, like you're almost throwing the towel in, you know? Like it's, So just to be still looking, to doing the best in what you could be doing and looking forward, positivity is like essential, I think, to have a, like a, a healthy mindset you know the goal of crossfit is to help people general improve their general physical preparedness so that's being probably pretty good at everything and not necessarily amazing at anything so it's not a specific program that would specifically help you with a certain sport you'd still need to do um some specific training for that but it'll give you it'll tick a lot of boxes it's trying to get across the message that fast and shit is still shit you know mm. yeah. like that, that is the thing and what we're trying to do is get you good at moving under intensity and we created medicine balls out of um, basketballs we'd split them open and put sand in them and put like punch repair glue on them to seal them up that didn't work very well that was like duct tape them back up and sand in people's <laughs> eyes and all sorts Gordon Ryan, welcome to the Everyday Respect Podcast. <laughs> I was fucking waiting for <laughs> What's happened to your air, mate? <laughs> mate, I just fell into a sink full of bleach. Yeah. <laughs> so, come on. I've seen a ghost, mate. Do I look white? It's, it's platinum. Yeah, it's all right, yeah. isn't it? You going, you going for the full Gordon Ryan, mate? You getting the beard done as well? Shall I? <laughs> Shall I? Nah. No? Oh, I think it's a bit shit, in fairness. Gordon, yeah. if you're listening. I think I'm Gordon sure. Ryan from two years ago, mate, it's a good look. It's yeah, I think, black, no, I think the black beard with, with the... the the tint is all right. Yeah. Do you like it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something that I'd have, mate. Yeah, well, we know that, mate. But, um, yeah, it's all right. So it's a look, mate, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, I had to have a dig, mate. I had to have a dig. <laughs> all right. Uh, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Um, please like and subscribe. Um, it really supports the channel. Today's guest is James Bish, um, owner of Plymouth CrossFit um, and keen CrossFit competitor. Welcome, mate. Hi Paul, uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. My first podcast, so I'm popping the cherry with you guys. <laughs> yeah, awesome, mate. No, we can't wait. And we, we just were chatting offline, actually. It's, it's a really interesting topic because we're really passionate about men's health. And one thing we've talked about tons already is the fact that physical adversity, community, building camaraderie and sort of group exercise seems to have a really profound impact on improving men's mental health. Mm. And we've talked tons about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because we're quite passionate about it. Um, and CrossFit's come up on a few occasions, um, and especially around the community, ele community element. So it's great to get you on as an expert in CrossFit, just to understand a little bit more about it. So I guess that's really the first question, like what is CrossFit? Um, I think it's actually got quite a few parallels to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and like you say, the community side of things, um, which is what, like the glue that sort of binds people and keeps them coming, I think. Um, CrossFit itself is, by definition, um, th there's quite a lot to it. So, uh, kind of, it's constantly varied functional movement performed at high intensity. Um, so, the constant variety might be the different movement patterns, the different time domains of the workout, um, kind of the different equipment that you use. Uh, functional movement would be kind of everyday. Uh, compound movements, so multi-joint movements um, that have a good trade-off for maybe the work that you do or the lifestyle that you have or want to have or the sport that you play. Um, and then the intensity is is kind of the bit that gets results really. Um, it's maybe harnessing people in an environment where they can perhaps push a little bit harder than they would normally. Um, that's the bit as coaches we've got to be quite careful with because um, we could either push too soon or we could, uh, you know, maybe not push enough dependent on the individual and the personality. So um, between those sort of three things, that kind of creates the framework of what CrossFit is and, and why it works. Um, the goal of CrossFit is to help people gener improve their general physical preparedness. So that's being probably pretty good at everything and not necessarily amazing at anything. So it's not a 
specific program that would specifically help you with a certain sport you'd still need to do um some specific training for that but it'll give you it'll tick a lot of boxes um yeah and that what it can also help with is to is generally improve people's kind of work capacity uh, across broad time and model domain so if you take one end of a spectrum being kind of power and strength and then the other uh, aerobic capacity and endurance it sort of broadens across time their ability to uh, both ends where like prior to crossfit uh, we well from my perspective i kind of focused on you are over one or the other um which is probably for me as a competitor in various different sports why I didn't excel because my training was always a bit in the middle ground. Yeah. Um, so when CrossFit came along, it was like, wow, I could actually maybe be good mm. at something because <laughs> it, it favours the generalist as opposed to the, the specialist. So um, so that's sort of CrossFit as a, as a training methodology, I suppose. Um, then it's how I'd explain that to sort of a, a, a new member because that, that might be a bit overwhelming to sort of take in as I oh, just want to just want to lose a bit of weight really or whatever you know it's a bit, a bit just deep. to clarify when you talk about compound compound movements and and all that type of stuff people may not know what that is yeah so is that like barbell movements um what what, so, what, what so do you mean by that a compound movement can be a, is a multi-joint movement whereby you're and the equipment's irrelevant in some respects. So we will use barbells, maybe medicine balls, kettlebells, um, sandbags, that kind of thing, as opposed to um, using sort of specific equipment that will isolate muscles. So in effect, you've got multiple limbs moving. And therefore, if you've got a lot of limbs moving, you've got a lot of joints moving, therefore you've got a lot of muscles moving, as opposed to an isolation movement where you're perhaps using one joint and then you've got, just got the muscles around that joint yeah. working. So I suppose really you, you've got a bit of a difference between um, sort of training maybe for aesthetics with, comp, with sort of um, single joint movements yeah. and focusing on isolation and like mind muscle connection yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. to then compound movements, which is like uh, um, maybe so, a lot more skill comes into play then still having a mind muscle connection and a bodily awareness but um focusing on kind of speed and technique and that kind of thing as well mm. so um yeah that's where that will come to play. yeah it makes sense it was something that paris talked about a bit wasn't it he was the physiotherapist that we had on um, a couple of episodes ago where he was talking about sort of kinetic sort of chains and and everything else and it feels like when you do compound movements it's a little bit more it crosses over to everyday movements and activities as well as you say, I think isolation, you, you kind of summed it up perfectly. I think it's about, it, it can, it does have some rehabilitation benefits, I think, in regard to injury recovery and that type of thing. But primarily it's aesthetic um, and, and bodybuilding and, and isolating that one muscle, but doesn't necessarily transfer all that well to different types of multiplayer movements in everyday activities and obviously functional sports as well. Yeah, yeah. I think my light bulb moment when I first started doing CrossFit many, many moons ago was... Um, was surfing because I, I, I'm not from this area I'm from Kent originally I come down and in my head I was always a surfer um, I was an inland billabong sort of quicksilver kind of guy uh, long hair and an earring um, got in the water and I was like oh shit I'm not a surfer <laughs> this is hard and I kind of plugged away at it um, had like a seven foot ten mini mouth board and just kept going and kept going didn't seem to be getting any better and it sort of coincided with come, when I found CrossFit, I was a, a kind of a bit of a fair weather surfer. So I knocked it on the head in November when the sea was getting a bit cold and, and, and kind of found CrossFit and was doing CrossFit over the winter. First sort of nice day in March, April, I was back in the sea. And for one, I got out beyond all the white water that usually crushed me. Um, and then secondly, you know, I popped up. I think that must attribute it to a lot of burpees or whatever that I've been doing. Um, and then I stayed up as well. So the balance side of things as well. And I thought well, the only thing that's changed, because I have not been surfing, was my training methodology mm. has sort of changed fairly dramatically from what I was doing. I think a lot so, of those, those compound movements like really help your posterior chain and your abs and all yeah. that sort of movement, you know, that it, it does make such a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. To yeah. Just yeah doing, so, doing so then the I've, I enjoyed surfing a lot more, you know, and I thought, <laughs> yeah. well, if, if it's going to help, you know the trade-off in that then other sport if i do crossfit 
I, I, if I want to go rock climbing or kayaking or mountain biking or, or whatever the things I enjoy doing, it's going to keep me in relatively good nick without having to just keep doing that sort of thing, you know. So, yeah, that was good. And we, we kind of asked, obviously, the question around what is CrossFit, and you've talked about the physical component of it. But I think, like, we, we kind of opened up with it. It feels like it's much more than, than just exercise as well. So how, how would you describe... The, the, almost the non-exercise component of CrossFit. How would you sum that up? Um, I think I think it seems to once you once you embrace it, it becomes a lifestyle that you kind of um, sort of the training is an element, and then obviously the nutrition side of things is becomes a little bit more of an element fuel in your performances, um, and then just your other things like your sleep and recovery and mobility side of things, but also the type of people that you will train with as well um so i I don't know previously having worked in kind of more typical gym um i'd say you you know i was always one of the instructors or trainers that would be putting like these challenges on the board and you'd you'd maybe get like five people five to ten people that out of you know hundreds of people would would do them and they always seem to be the people that loved and enjoyed training you know they're not just doing it to tick a box uh, monday wednesday friday tick been to the gym Mm. you know they were interested in training they were passionate about it and i think that's what when crossfit started it seemed to be it seems to just scoop a lot of that kind of person up um and then you were just daily mixing with people that love challenges and you know were positive you know were really kind of um had a, had a good outlook on life and that for me was quite important really because as i was like just you know a bit cliche but surround yourself with people that you want to be like or that energize you and 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 it did just that you know so going from me being a trainer trying to motivate people all the time took took quite a bit out of my bucket mm-hmm. <laughs> um whereas when when i started doing crossfit and the sort of people that it initially kind of brought across you know I was, I was just buzzing you know the whole time it was, really, it was really good and I think that that hasn't changed um yeah the community side of things is is great and you know after a period for me it's it's my livelihood uh it's been my hobby uh it's been my social life as well so it, you know like thankfully it's given me a hell of a lot in that respect you know um so I've got to be a lot to, I've got a lot to be grateful for for it Uh, And I think others have as well, you know, it's been places that people have become long-term friends, people have, you know, met their partners and got married and, Mm -hmm. you know, we've seen people come, get meet, get married, have kids, you know, etc. So, yeah, it's, you don't see that as quite so much in normal gyms, I don't. don't Yeah, no, I agree. I don't think you do. And I think sometimes looking from the outside in, um, people will see CrossFit, boxes and and those doing crossfit shirts off jacked you know just they look a bit mental um so so who's crossfit for is it is it just for the competitive types or you know if you have like a shy and assuming person walk in the doors like how would they fit into that environment do you think everyone and anyone is it everyone and anyone i can see the perception and yeah. i totally understand it you know like back in the, I got into CrossFit because I watched the movie 300 okay. and, um, <laughs> that's a fucking great film by know, the way there's not, there's not one guy in there that isn't ripped and yeah. you know so my interest was oh how do these guys train and it worked out that they trained with um, a guy called Jim Jones which was had an affi- you know he had a they, there was a partnership between CrossFit and him somehow it was too early for me to know a great deal about it um, and then there was this workout called the 300 workout and you know, I used to do that every Saturday with my mates. and um, It started and ended with 25 pull-ups and then it was 50 of various things in between and you sort of had deadlifts at 60 kilograms and box jumps and press-ups and these floor wiper things. So you're holding a barbell and your feet are going to the barbell, like a core movement. <laughs> That's ringing a bell yeah. actually now. Yeah, I think, I I think there's 50 kettlebell swings and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, we used to do that like every Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> but, but already um, though, that, that sounds like that would just eliminate so many people. Of course, is... yeah. The, I suppose then I was different. I was, you know, late 20s, early 30s, still got far too much testosterone front floating around my body and that appealed to me. And um, however, you know, like it was you know i was a trainer and then i found 
I, I sort of was training in a CrossFit style of way, but I found CrossFit was a thing and it was actually a system and, and stuff like that. So, you, you know, I, I felt and I saw that there was longevity. I was excited because I could see that there, I had longevity as, as a trainer within that. Um, these days, we really do our best to kind of help to sort of gather anyone and anyone in, anyone that's willing to, you know, want to try to get fitter. And there's no reason why the movements can't be scaled to all individuals of any age, you know, any ability, um, you know, and I'll sort of explain that in our, in our particular programming that we do. So scalability is a massive thing. It's really important for us that people get the right workout for them, you know, and we meet them where they're at. And, and all CrossFit gyms are the same because, you know, all those original people, you know, they might have gone on and done got to other things now, you know, so we can't just be that same group of 100 people forever. You know, it, it, it filters in with new people and the people that come in these days, you know, might never have been in a gym before. And what appeals to them is that we've got no mirrors. You know, there's kind of um, there's a feel about the place where people talk to each other. So, you know, we don't have phones or whatever whilst you're training so people haven't got headphones in um we sort of talk about the workout prior to and then generally we'll kind of do things that help people um integrate so we'll we'll do partner workouts or team workouts um we strategically position people next to people that like like to chat a bit so we know that they're going to be welcoming so just little things like that really um to get literally anyone and everyone into into it and on I, I totally understand the the perception when you, you you know you you look at crossfit and you might come up with the crossfit games or you might see the fittest enough netflix documentaries and i think me and dan were saying before how that can either that that will either excite you or or repel you and the gyms and and for for most people that really need the gym you know it's a overwhelming place anyway um so yeah i can understand that crossfit might seem to be just not on their radar um but then you know it only takes a few once you get a few people in and they lose a few kilograms and their friends start to talk about it and they said no you should come along you know like there's people like there's women in their 60s and and whatever so that's our job as affiliate owners really to to do our best to kind of just welcome everyone and and you know make it as accessible for for every, everyone really. Hi gents, just interrupting the episode to tell you about our sponsor Eden Clinic for Men. You might remember episode 13 when we had Dr. Angela Service on talking about male testosterone deficiency. Um, this is potentially linked to things like low mood, um, low energy, obesity, low libido. So there's a number of different things that this could have an impact on. So if this applies to you, your mates, your dad, your brother, or even if it doesn't and you want to get a baseline number of where your testosterone levels are at, then check out the link below and get yourself a well-man check booked in and they do a full blood test, which will also include your hormones, so your testosterone, but also diabetes check as well, so your HbA1c, uh, your lipid profile, which is cholesterol, triglycerides, so the fats in your blood, um, kidney function, liver function, so pretty much everything you need to check to maintain your quality health so check out the link below get yourself checked out and stay in tip-top health you just made an interesting point there about the phones and the headphones and stuff it's not something i've ever actually really thought about before yeah that was the first time i ever thought about it was when i went crossfit yeah because um, obviously in you know we, we was again going back to jiu-jitsu obviously you're on the mat so you can't have devices so that that kind of forces you to to interact with people in front of you doesn't it and obviously in consumer gyms and you know, a lot of normal gyms, people just train in silo often, don't yeah. they? And they won't talk to each other. They're fucking filming themselves half the time these days. Yeah. Sat on a fucking machine for 20 minutes <laughs> looking at their phone. And I want to smash them in the face. <laughs> but I, yeah, I never, I never really thought about it. But yeah, it's interesting to hear that CrossFit yeah. that just don't have that. And that, that would explain a lot, I think. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, all training's good. And if it helps you get through an hour of training with headphones on, then do, do whatever floats your boat. But because we need to coach and we need to communicate and there's lots going on, it can't happen and as a result of that you know i think communication and just general inter human interaction mm -hmm. you know is 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 great if you don't necessarily get a lot of that or enough of that in your in your week really yeah, so i think the group exercise stuff as well creates a competitiveness and within the group so even if you're new you still have that desire to do better than maybe the person next to you 
And I remember when I first went in, and you had uh, I had Sam who had been doing it like a year, and I was I was always like, you know, always always fairly fit. And then Sam was like smashing me on everything, like you know, cleaning jerk. He's he's like way smaller than me, and I was like, he's fucking cleaning jerk and way heavier than me. He's doing this heavier than me. You know what I mean? And I remember thinking, fucking hell, I've got to pull my finger out here. And then that's how it, you kind of become obsessed with it, isn't it? And you want to. You want to drive for those numbers to get better, get better. Similar to jiu-jitsu, really, but in a in a fitness way rather than a technical side. About back in the day, we used to have um, so it'd be a whiteboard where we put everyone's scores on. Uh, we've, we've since then we don't really do that. Do you not do it no more? No. I used to do that. Yeah, I used because, to love that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we just found like people will cut corners to like oh, ele- those, oh I won't name names there's a few down there <laughs> that used to cut reps all the time and we used to be like fucking doing it again yeah, look. <laughs> yeah, to elevate their uh, position on the leaderboard and <laughs> like it was a COVID thing really that we sort of got away from congregating all together because at the end of the workout we'd all kind of get together and you'd have some people go yeah, I did it in 10 minutes. And I was like, oh, I only did it in 15, you know, and they go away really disheartened that they, oh, I'm not as good as everyone else. But, and I think this was for us, was a, for, was part of a turning point where, you know, if we're wanting to get people in from a health perspective and not just a performance perspective, you know, it's very disheartening to be bottom of any leaderboards or lists or whatever else. Don't get me wrong. I was a sucker for it for years and you know if I weren't at the top I was fucking yeah he's not, fucking yeah I you're a fit boy mate I was, not, I was not particularly happy yeah, yeah. Um, but you know it, it it is quite refreshing to just say like guys it, it, you know focus on your technique you know like don't worry about the score etc well, that's so. what I was going to say that I, I remember I can't remember the guy's name I won't mention him anyway but I remember when I was going down there and he he used to um rush his reps and I remember you had fucking a go at him a few times he was rushing his reps to beat other people but then his form was poor I remember with like I think it was deadlifts and stuff it was it was you just kept pulling him you was like get here <laughs> got to sort that out got to sort that out stop fucking rushing to keep up with Danny stop, you know what I mean and I remember you saying that to him just because it was like he would literally just the, the worst technique you've ever seen like how are you fucking denar his back you know and then but that's not on you that's on them isn't it to like it's, it's trying to get across the message that fast and shit is still shit you know mm. yeah. that, is, that is thing and we're, what we're trying to do is get you good at moving under intensity and not you know not taking shortcuts with the movement the movement is the movement no matter what and that even if your heart rate's 180 beats a minute it's still the movement you know even if it's against the clock and you're racing you know racing someone or whatever else it's still the movement kind of thing so that for us as coaches is really like it's quite important to say really like our, our focus behind the scenes is that people work with good mechanics then they work consistently and then they work with intensity and they don't then like bypass any of those two things first um, and that's where probably you know like if, if CrossFit does get a bad rep for form etc um, it's important to know that all, all coaches that I know know that have that ethic you know and have that sort of desire to make people like move well um and then move and then move fast it's sort of quite frustrating when people kind of i, I understand it because sometimes the red mist kicks in <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I do get it but um it, it essentially we're training for health fitness and performance and that means you know you can't perform well if you're not healthy so if you hurt yourself then what's the point um and also in my mind, a, a good training methodology is one you can still do kind of kicking and screaming into your 60s, 70s and 80s. So, you know, like that's got to be a bit in your on your radar as well, you know. Yeah, so. good. And, and where did it start from? Because it's it's an amazing concept. Um, I think, you know, sort of adding that slightly competitive edge to just, you know, exercise and some of the things that you've just talked about in regard to what makes it quite unique. When, 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 who, who kind of came up with that concept and, and when? So it's a great story, actually. So um, the original founder of CrossFit was a guy called Greg Glassman, uh, and he founded it with his then wife, uh, Lauren Glassman. Um, so this was in, I believe, 20, uh, sorry, 1996, when he started to basically merge. He was an ex-gym, ex professional gymnast um so he would utilize things that he'd learned for the world of gymnastics 
um, pull in stuff that he knew that worked from the world of weightlifting, combine that with aerobic work as well. And then as a personal trainer, that's how he trained his clients. Um, so what he then, this was quite unique and he used to sort of, sort of like rent corners of gyms and what that's where he would practice. Um, it was quite unique, got results pretty quickly. Uh, and then he got well known as a trainer. So people would then, you, you, he, he basically, there's only a certain number of hours in a day where you can train people. So he started to go, oh, Paul, you're a bit like Danny. You know, you've got same similar kind of um, goals and similar kind of like movement patterns, etc., and experience. So what about if you two guys train together now, you know, and it's quite smart because he would, you know, he would utilize his time a little bit better. What he then found is that you want to beat him and you'll work harder because you want to beat him and he'll work a bit harder because you're now beating him um, in workouts. So that all of a sudden your fitness like was leveraged, but your interest in training was more. So, you know, did it work for two? If it works for two, will it work for four? And it kind of went from being personal training, small group personal training, and then never under his sort of ownership, never when he was a gym owner, did it come like the big group thing that is today. So that was kind of, he uh, he owned his first CrossFit gym in 2001 in Santa Cruz, California. Um, and then to leverage the, f to leverage the methodology, he created the CrossFit certification. So um, there was then a level one certification that you could do and then start your own CrossFit gym. So that sort of led to the growth of CrossFit. Now, now there's a level one, two, three, and four. Um, so yeah, that was the, that was the origins, I suppose. I think I did a bit of like looking at the numbers yesterday. Um, and you know, from 2001 to then something like 2018 in its peak, it went from being that one gym to, to something in the region of 15,000 gyms worldwide across a hundred, over 150 countries, yeah. you know, and if you take that every gym's got, I don't know, on average uh, between a hundred and 200 members, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, you know, that's, that's a lot of people. So that's kind of where it came from, personal training, yeah. combining people together, seeing the magic in that sort of like that, that environment then. And then it just it just created that momentum. Yeah, amazing. What came first? Was it that, that kind of franchise model or was it the competition? So, well, I think the first CrossFit Games was in 2007. So you've got sort of a six or seven year gap then yeah. between when it was initially a training methodology. Yeah. So I think that's quite important to know the roots of it is that it's a training methodology that comprises weightlifting, gymnastics and aerobic activity, mm -hmm. um, which was very effective. Uh, the level one then happened, so that led to the spread of different gyms. And then in 2007, 2008 was the first CrossFit Games, which happened in at Dave Castro, who was the director of the Games, CrossFit Games, for a long period of time, um, at his family ranch. Uh, it's awesome to watch if you've ever seen any of the documentaries because it really you you just look at it and you think, oh, I reckon I could. I reckon I'll be right there. I reckon I, reckon I could hold, hold my own there. <laughs> what, the original ones? The original ones. Yeah, yeah the original yeah. ones. Yeah. It's like you just literally turn yeah. up, you know, you would... Pay your entry yeah, free. I'll, I'll be it, right. was, it was class, yeah. How long have you been doing it? Oh, a couple of months, I'll be, I'll be fine. You know, and that appealed to me then. I thought, yeah, that's something I, I could have a go at that. Um, and I think really it was quite... This is my theory. I think... The CrossFit Games came about originally as a showcase to show how effective this training methodology was. Now, what I don't think they anticipated was how much traction the CrossFit Games and how much appeal that the sport side of it would get. Now, I think this is what led eventually to the original kind of founder yeah. to become sort of disinterested in the direction that it was taking okay. because he was probably, if there's health, fitness and performance, he was more interested in you know like someone getting their first pull up and um you know being able to counteract disease than he was interested in someone doing like running a five minute mile or something like that so i think this is it it, it, it started to become two things mm -hmm. um so yeah it was probably so so 2007 2008 first games 2011 was the first time the, the Reebok got on board with CrossFit and it just 
where the prize money alone went from $25,000 to $250,000. So it, it 10 times. What's it up to now? What's it up to now? It's, it's loads, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a fucking massive events now, though, aren't they? Yeah. Really so the guys events. originally that were winning were cross uh, were box owners, like gym owners, that had just had a bit of luxury of time to train a bit more than other people. They were not necessarily super special, but yeah. um, you know now they're just full time. Who, who was the first like superstar? Was it was it like Rich Fronin? Was he like the real first stup- superstar? I can't well, remember. He's because of the the time. I mean, he was dominant for f- I think it's four years. Right. So because of that was early though wasn't it that was early was it ish he he was on the scene maybe 2012 2013 right so when the money started getting bigger that's when he was yeah yeah. so his first game he's actually he comes second i think in his first games like it's a it's quite an interesting story as well and if you 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 know he he was i think he used to play baseball american football but it was from a big family like and you go to you go to some of their early documentaries and he was fit just because he didn't want to get beaten up by his cousins and brothers and what <laughs> yeah. he had to be fit it's a bit of a get fit or die sort of scenario um and then his i remember seeing him at his first crossfit games he was wild he just bearing in mind the crossfit games is over three four days and it's like multiple events per day yeah. so really you've got to be thinking of it like an endurance event really rather than just like power 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 he, he didn't take any advice like he just went for it absolutely went for <laughs> it and it was so cool to see um but it left him in his last workout he just had to finish in the top three or four i think it was to to win and it was rope climbing and he just, oh, I, me- and he, I remember this i watched it on his documentary when he couldn't get up yeah did he? so he didn't know the technique so it was like rope climbing efficiently he uses your arms and your legs and he was just using his arms and he was up and he was in the lead and then that his grip went and his arm strength went and he just couldn't reach the top and he just saw his his win just, just yeah just I went that. Um, but i think as a result of that like that the hurt of coming second in such a manner and under such a spotlight um you know he, he bounced back from that pretty good he didn't have many chinks in his armor after after that well i say that he he was renowned for not being the best sort of runner or the best swimmer but like I said, when these things cropped up he would come back and the following year they would present himself and he was he, he was so good with a barbell wasn't he yeah he was yeah so efficient good. so i think efficient. his thing was he's a monster he could train every day four or five times a day yeah i remember that so come the sunday of the event when everyone else was just hanging in there First, 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 first. So, so you, you know, his capacity to train. You're saying that he used to not used to train all day at this ranch, at his barn or whatever it was, wasn't it? Mm. And he used to not eat, like for actually all day, mm. train hours a day, wouldn't he? And then yeah. he would like just have a couple of protein shakes, whatever. And then he would just save all his calories for after. And I'd be like, <laughs> anyone who's done CrossFit, <laughs> you know, like fucking after an hour, yeah. it's it's fucking so taxing, isn't it? Yeah. When he was saying that, I was like, fuck it, now that's yeah. that is his ability to recover. Crazy, is just ridiculous. Um, he then sort of so as an individual, so yeah, he was the first big superstar, and I think there were there were definitely female superstars as well, but they seemed to chop and change a bit more year by year. There wasn't necessarily at that time a runner dominant. So mm. clear, to, yeah, I'd like to, an- Annie Forrest or yeah, really so she's early, still she? around. Like she was, she's still been competing there, now. So, yeah, so she sort of had a had a bit of time out to have a baby, and then um, she's back in the game. So she's phenomenal. Um, and then phrase at the the end of um, Rich Fronin's career, not individual career, and Matt's the start of Matt Fraser's career sort of overlapped a little bit. Fronin was still a bit ahead of the game. Fraser had a it was podium like top first couple of times and then his runner dominant sort of kicked in and then he he, he sort of bowed out at the top now he own, like he's got lots of fingers in pies so he's got a training company hwpo and i think he's involved in a supplement company and stuff like that so yeah. it's for him it's provide you know he's got a career out of it after because of who he is and yeah what he is yeah he was a fucking machine as, though as time goes on you know i don't know whether these opportunities are going to be available for these new guys because they're already being like how many supplement companies can there be how many clothing companies can there be and how many provi- training a uh, program providers can there be so um yeah, yeah it's from a, a career perspective maybe they're just going going to coaching or whatever i don't know but yeah or maybe um box on the ship but yourself mate yeah so tell us about that first question before you do actually I'd, I'd need to know this what's the difference between a gym and a box why do you call it a box 
just because most really are kind of like industrial units right, okay. square <laughs> or re rectangle and it's just stuck like I think that's just stuck really yeah okay fine I, I think it's a nice way of um, for us differentiating ourselves from from a gym because if people have that expectation in their mind you know you've got in your mind's eye you've got uh, air conditioning TVs and expensive equipment mm. you know so I think a box is quite a good way of preparing people <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. for, for, for it's like, a big like, empty see. room with a fucking pull up box <laughs> yeah. and, and you just get on with it so, well, it's, just, so it's just meant literally then yeah. okay yeah well I'd say that I'd say I'd like to think we're smack bang in the middle of you know what we class in the olden days as spit and sawdust mm. um, and corporate so I think we're nicely in the middle and I think that is a good place to, I think it harnesses, it's a good place to work hard. Yeah. Um, I think it leverages that, you know, there's, we've, you know, we're obviously focused on cleanliness and hygiene, but, um, you know, it's, there's what you need in there. It's functional. Um, our gym, our gym actually is, I love it. It's, it's, it's fantastic. So all CrossFit gyms look fairly similar. The main commodity is space. <laughs> Um, because once you pick a barbell up, you need a fair bit of room around that as well um, to, to move safely. So we're very fortunate that we've got, you know, 5,000 square foot unit. But, I've, you know, there's cross, people do CrossFit in their garages, so you don't necessarily need that much room. But once once there's multiple people together, you, yeah. you, you, you do benefit from a bit of space. So, yeah. Yeah, so how did Plymouth CrossFit come about? Um, well, so like I say probably from the movie 300 really I reckon there's quite a lot of CrossFit boxes back in the day <laughs> all came from that same movie um, so yeah that well that's I started doing CrossFit a year before I st I started uh, running the gym yeah and, and was that locally or were you back in Kent still at that, that was that was locally so okay. I was a trainer um, at Macaulay's health club um, in town and I that's where I move I, I, from Kent. I, that was my first job down here. A friend of ours owned it and said there's an opportunity. I didn't think much about it. And then I kind of looked into Plymouth and what it had going on. And like I said, I was always a surfer at heart. So I think that was the, the draw of the ocean brought me down. <laughs> uh, and a cheap housing uh, was also a benefit. Um, so I worked at Macaulay's for a bit. But like I say, there's a few of us that used to train with, I think actually like you ex sort of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu MMA type fighters that were doing circuit training with kettlebells and medicine balls and stuff like that so that sort of thing was starting to become quite interesting to me and then um, so yeah sort of like weight training circuits we were, were, were kind of doing that and then we we I was getting my sort of clients to do that and whatnot. so actually we, we were, I don't know I suppose we, maybe loosely doing some sort of cross training if you like prior to prior to hitting CrossFit and then we sort of saw that it was an actual thing and you could become an affiliate and whatever so um yeah that it, it stemmed from I started to uh run a boot camp in the park Victoria Park um so yeah that was my first sort of experience in outside of that where you was getting people together and I was kind of coaching, you know, functional movements, but with limited equipment. Then um, in when we affiliated, a friend of mine, Tom Barlow. Um, yeah, I know Tom. He's you know Tom? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a legend. And uh, so he worked or was a co-owner at um, Mars St. James Martial Arts Academy, along with um, Chief there. So I'm eternally for great, grateful for those guys because they they gave me the foot in the door to have a roof over our head because running a boot camp in October, like is or November, December, <laughs> yeah. is not, not much fun. So we bought it indoors, started the affiliate in 2008. Um, and that we, I think at the time, so we were one of the, between 10 and the 20th, I'm not exactly sure, CrossFit affiliate in the UK. So it was really one of the early adopters. Um, and we were there for a year. We had three rowers, two barbells, probably five, 12 kilogram kettlebells, five 16 kilogram kettlebells. We created a pull-up bar out of a scaffold or scaffold pole. <laughs> uh, we created a rope climbing with a scaffold pole right at the top of the building in there, in the, um, in, up in the beams. 
And I remember Tom holding the bottom of the ladder and me climbing up the ladder, uh, wrapping the rope round. We created medicine balls out of um, basketballs. We'd split them open and put sand in them and put like punch repair glue on them to seal them up. That didn't work very well. That was like duct tape them back up and sand in people's <laughs> eyes and all sorts. We had the side of his uh, ring, so he had a ring in the corner. So we had that for box jumps. And we run that for about a year. Uh, and that was pretty fun, but it was it was CrossFit circuit training, shall we say, because there's no way with that limited equipment that we could get everyone doing the same thing. Um, so we were kind of using, to the best of our ability, CrossFit moves or movements um, in a circuit sort of style. And then it, we've, we then progressed out of there because we just, we were running around the timetable of the Martial Arts Academy. So we only had like an eight o'clock slot in the evening and people were saying that I, I love it, but I just can't get to sleep. We're getting home and I'm wired and I can't get to sleep till sort of two in the morning. Yeah, so so we, exhausted as well. When you, you we were aware that it wasn't optimal, but we were, we were aware that it was better than nothing. So we then, um, I got, the, I found this little industrial, like tiny little 500 square foot unit in Catdown. And I think it was a carpenter's, where, a carpenter's workshop or something like that. It had sawdust everywhere. So we cleaned that right out, saw a little bit of potential in there, cleaned it all out, boarded the walls up, uh, back with the welder, put the scaffold, put the scaffold pole back up on the wall. Um, and then that was our first sort of real taste of group CrossFit training. But I could only fit six people in. And... So in an evening, I would like run back to back, half five, half six, half seven, six people at a time. Whereas previously, I'd run with 18 people in one hour in this group CrossFit session. like, And I'd come home buzzing. And now I'd run three back to back sessions. And now we're doing proper CrossFit. So it's kind of like a lot more coach intensive, um, more techniques involved. And I was getting home and I was like, I don't know if I've done the right thing here. This is hard. This is like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've got the same amount of people. It's taking three hours and I'm, I'm, I'm cooked. So, um, it, you know, we outgrew that space quite quickly. And this was only just people telling people, it was just re people referring people. And, and me having had trained as a trainer in Macaulay's and knowing those like people that like those gym challenges and that would probably like CrossFit. So, um, yeah, we then moved to a bigger unit in, I think, what was it, 2000 and, 2010, I think. Yeah, 2010. Mm -hmm. Two and a half thousand square foot. Looked the part. It looked like the original CrossFit box in Santa Cruz. So it was like, we've made it, you know, we're, we're there. Big roll of doors, mezzanine, you know. Um, we had a dog running around, like, which is sort of synonymous with CrossFit gyms and, uh, really, really good. I, my, me and my, well, actually, my, my dad from Kent come, used to come down and we turned this unit around in about a month. And that, like he, that guy, he worked on cups of tea and fresh air for like 12, 14 hour days, like putting together the changing rooms and just getting the place ready. And then we opened that and we were there for three years. And that was really good, actually. That was like a, that was a really good time because I think CrossFit itself had found it. It was starting to find its identity in with Reebok coming on board and it would identify as the sport of fitness. And that for me at the time, that really suited where I wanted to take it, you know. Um, and it was exciting. There was clothing now that you could get specifically for it. And the, the games were sponsored and they, they were now in stadiums and stuff like that. The gym looked like a legit CrossFit gym. Um, and now you could finally buy stuff rather than have to make stuff, <laughs> make stuff. <laughs> you know, it's starting to actually become a real thing. And we'd, we'd just grown and, and emerged organically through this whole process. And we were, we were aware that we were part of something new. Um, it was exciting. Um, so yeah, my dad would often come down and he would be like, right, what projects now? Or we need a rack over there or we want, you know, these, uh, wall ball sort of uh, plates put up and or we need a new pull up bit section for the pull up rig and it was a good way actually of um going off track here but with me and me and my dad reconnecting because mm. we'd always like back in my youth i'd race motorbikes and played football and that was our thing our bonding thing and of course going away and going to university you, you then divide and you do your own thing but this was us sort of coming back together um so yeah then 
yeah, I, I was quite heavily into the com competition side of things as well there, and that was also good for like all of us as a gym and my mum and dad to come and watch. And um, what was the composi competition scene like back then? It was good because it wasn't it, there weren't that many, so it would concentrate everyone into certain areas. Did so, you have to travel a bit, or yeah, I think the the first big team comp that we did was uh, at CrossFit Velocity in Swansea. It was called Divided We Fall, and that was the big one annually. Um, so I think that was around about the same time as the, or, or a little bit before maybe the the CrossFit Open sort of started in a, in a slightly different way. But so that was the first one, and it, like I say, it just condensed everyone to certain areas. And we went, I think we went, we went up there the first year in. I can't remember how we found out about it, but we, it was teams of four: two guys, two girls. And the gym at the time was really male dominant. Like we we did have a few women, but they had beards as well. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, I don't mean that. I mean they were, you know, like they were tough. You know, like they would just roll the sleeves up and get involved and didn't think anything of it. So that was a challenge for us at the time. Was kind of like, well, we we want to compete, but these team things like involve girls as well. So it would be like if some if if a, a girl might have only been a member for like two or three weeks. <laughs> There's this like little social that we're all, about, <laughs> you know, it should be a really fun weekend. There's a few competitions, but that's not the be all and end all, you know, like we're just going up there, it's a trip to Swansea, oh yeah, I'll get involved, you know, like, and we chuck them right in just so that we, so that <laughs> so we you could, could try. compete. Um, but yeah, we got a real good taster of it from there, actually. And we just saw, it was lovely because being in Plymouth, like you're a bit isolated, you're arse end of nowhere and there wasn't much opportunity to have an overlap with people. So going up there, you, it's the first time, like there's this big sort of fucking hell, CrossFit is everywhere of all shapes and sizes. And, you know, at the time you didn't know how good you were. You didn't know because we only had each other to compare ourselves to. So, you know, going there was a real test and you, you just hear these like, you'd be doing a weightlifting thing and you'd hear this barbell hit the floor and like someone's fucking hell. Just clean and jerked 160 kilograms up there. Like what? <laughs> Struggling with 100 here, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that was like the first thing. So as a result of that, we just went back to the gym and said, "Look, you've got to do this." Like we, we were just really black and white. It's like you just do it. You've got to do it. It's a great experience, you know. Whoever you were. Um, so we were probably quite motivated by the competition scene at that point. But, um, which was, you know, which, which was good, all good fun. Um, yeah, and then I, I suppose that, so that, the competition scene as well, like it changed, the, the Open changed. So the CrossFit, CrossFit game starts with uh, the CrossFit Open, which is accessible to anyone in the world. So I think that's a really cool, cool, cool concept. Yeah, you mentioned that before, I think when we were chatting to Will, wasn't it, episode one? Yeah. And so I, he, I was fascinated. He's a, he was a doc, he's a doctor yeah. who uh, based at uh, Exeter. Yeah, he is now, yeah. And he does a bit of CrossFit. Mm. And then we were just talking about the Open. So, But can you explain the Open in a bit more detail? Because I, I think I fucking yeah. got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so how it was then, so this was the first year and it, it, it did change a little bit. And I think they've got back on track with a similar format now. So they released the workout on, so it was a Friday night and then you had till the Monday to complete it. And you could either do it in your own facility with a judge of like, um, within your own facility and then the owner had to validate the score so it was pretty legit you know all the stands were pretty good or you could film it and send it in uh, there was one workout in that original year and I think it stayed like the same format for a few years there was one workout a week for six weeks so you had effectively three days to complete a workout now initially you know you'd see the workout you would you would practice it you would have a go, then you wouldn't be happy with it. Then you try it again. You know, you would do it time and time and time again um, until you're sort of happy with your score. Or, yeah. or time ran out, it's Monday, and I can't, physically can't do it anymore now. I've <laughs> yeah. just got to hand the score. No more something. burpees. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, so then you, I think particularly the first one, because like I say, we just didn't know if we were good, bad or average or shit or what we didn't know. So we just just make sure we did the best that we could put the scores in um and then i think on that for first one the story was that the the system wasn't prepared for the amount of volume that was coming through so it crashed so they then announced that we had another week i was like oh no i can't take any more so they they brought out the following workout but they said you still got time to do the initial one i said i'm not doing that one anymore this is affecting my training because i'm just overdoing the same things so yeah then we went through week by week 
Um, and we sort of said, we, we could see that as a gym, we were, because there's a, an individual score and then there's your combined scores, which then accumulate to your team score. Okay. And we could see that actually we were doing all right. So there was a, there was a couple of us, there was different levels, but there was probably 10, 10 guys and four or five girls that were all contributing really well to the scores. So we said, look, well, no matter what happens, we'll comp- like if we get there, to the next stage we'll compete as a team um so then as the weeks went on and i think the cutoff point to get to what was then the european regionals was uh was 60 um so we, as the weeks went on and long story well the last few last two weeks i had man flu and they were the only two workouts that i did was the the open workouts and just managed to kind of muddle through them and me one of a lad and uh, danny Watson and Maz Glover, we all end up uh, qualifying for the individual at regionals. So we came in, although we'd said originally about doing team, we came in the next day, I went, I'm doing individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, I'm the same. We just said, we didn't know if we'd ever get that opportunity again. We were very aware that this was the first year it's going to grow. They don't they do not do regionals anymore, do they? They do now. They started oh, again. Start again. Yeah, they yeah, started again. Yeah, they started again. So I've, I've really like recently struggled to keep up with the What's form. Going it's on, chopped yeah. and changed a little bit. But essentially, it all ends up in the same place. And the cream always rises to the top. So you always get the, the best guys. Did you go the to the regionals? Game. Yeah, it's in Bolton. In uh, the, 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 I thought it was going to be in the Reebok Stadium. Right, because yeah, of the yeah. association yeah, of course, with yeah. Reebok Stadium. But it was at Bolton Reebok Stadium, but in, on an athletics track next to it. Right. You could see that you could see the stadium <laughs> in the background. Oh, no so all, all, all my visions of grandeur walking out and like yeah. Yes, well, well anyway, it was it was great. It was a it was a good weekend. Um there were six workouts, like you had to get through, you had to qualify to get through to the following day each time. Uh and managed to jump from well qualified 48th managed to finish 24th um in europe <coughs> that's pretty good i'm living off of that ever since that ever since then um so yeah that that was a awesome experience the workouts like the first workout didn't favor me at all then a few of them did and then thankfully i didn't get through to the last day because it was horrendous it would have been just embarrassing so (laughs) i got the opportunity to sit there and go yeah i would have been amazing at that and no one no one knew any different (laughs) um so yeah that was a but we got to mix with then the elite level in europe you know like some of these were going on to the crossfit games and whatever else so what an experience and we took up probably i think there's about 30 people from our gym all went up and we were notoriously for the loudest gym you know anytime crossfit plymouth was mentioned you know our team qualified as well so i think we come in the top 10 i think we were ninth ninth or tenth in out of europe so yeah times were good but i think i think then looking back i associated and and i linked together the business side of it and the competitive side of it and i thought well like it's the double-edged sword because I've got to, I want to do well individually and as and as athletically, but also then that's going to put the business in a better light, spotlight as well. Um, and I may be right, maybe wrong in thinking that. And we kind of went down that route for a, a little while, but then I, as time went on, um, it, you know, it's actually, you look at it and it's only a small percentage of your members that actually do these competitions, like they want to do them. Yeah. So then we started to realize that if you just focus on the competitive athletes, you know, like you're losing a lot of your hobbyists. Yeah, that's five yeah, to yeah. 10% and, it, and, and you, you, you lose track of where the 80% want to, yeah. what they want to do. So I think you've, we've got a better perspective of that these days, you know, and if, if people want to compete, great, but there's opportunities locally, ample opportunity yeah. for them to sort of go and do it. And did you, um, think, cool. sorry, did you, uh, did you have any athletes that went to the CrossFit games at any point? Yep. So Maz Glover, absolute legend. Uh, she qualified in 2018 after years of trying, bless her heart. She was like on the cusp. So she's a master's athlete. So she was actually one of the ones that com- qualified as an individual. All fairness to her, she was 40 odd at the time when she qualified as an individual up against 18 year olds and whatever. So that's an amazing achievement on its own. Yeah, that's crazy. That was in 2011. And then... It- so seven years on she made it to the games and she tried every year and like it's probably my my high point in crossfit was like seeing maz kind of like make it 
make it there. And to see someone like, you don't often see someone write down their dreams, like, and, and what their goals are and achieve them. You know, like big lofty. That's what I was about to say. Such a high expectation, and yeah, to get yeah. to that is is ridiculous. You know, well, what it's, I mean? like, it's like it's like an MMA guy going UFC, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. It, I, I, I'm like makes me well, I'm f- emotional just thinking about it because I do remember in Macaulay, she was with me, and she'd say, she said, "Oh, I want to go to the games." And she was expecting me to just fuck off, you know, like don't be stupid or whatever. And I said, "Well, you can do whatever you think you can do, you know, like, and if you want to do it." let's try it it's going to make it happen you know and then I just I sat and watched her year upon year upon year because it's a top 20 that make it through and she was in and around that cup but just the wrong side of it <sighs> you know and it was just heartbreaking to see and I was like how much can this how much more can she take of getting this close and then eventually she qualified and I don't know whether she was 18th 19th or 20 but she just made it in that happened that that happened and then it was like right let's not get too excited about it until you see that you are officially invited to the crossfit games just in case something happens yeah they know, do a lot a of the weird shit don't they? Video, like, someone's videos yeah. like subs- um subscription or whatever was wrong or whatever it's just just wait so then it was it she made it i was like awesome we're going to the games you know? <laughs> like, did you I go to, i said to the wife i don't care what we're doing we're going to i'm going to the games and me and my mum went out there actually, and then Maz went out with um, her partner at the time, Pete. Um, and it was it, uh, the 2018 was just before COVID hit, so it was just the sort of like the. It was probably it's been talked about as one of the biggest and best sort of thing, um, and it's just an amazing experience. And I think for Maz, like being out there alone, she'd already won. Like she'd won just being there. hundred oh, percent. You know, so yeah. like I. I with Maz, like she, you need a lot of help to get to that level. So, you know, I, I certainly can't profess to be in her coach like throughout this period of time. So she had multiple coaches, nutritionists, mm-hmm. sort of like to to help her and a lot of support as well. You know, she's a lovable character. So people would, at any given chance, if she's got a qualifying workout to do, they'd get down there in their droves and cheer her on. So there's a lot of people involved in helping her get there. You know, but it was nice just sort of like be a bit of a backbone for her. I see her every day, you know, she's a lovely character. She's awesome. Um, and to see her sort of make it. And then when she was there, she was so funny because she'd, she'd, they'd announce like the athletes as they come out and everyone was there like game faces on, game face on. And Maz would come out. She'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> like this. And I was like, fucking calm down, man. You've know, you you, you still got a bit of a job to do. You know? And, um, she did she did really really well actually there was a as a like i say it's a long sort of three or four days and like the she she had some good finishes against some amazing athletes and she looked the part she looked like she should be there um and then i think the things that she dreaded the most was she knew there's a swim that come up and if you could see man swim first of all she's like i was like chucking a baby in the water and it all <laughs> like flapping around and then she'd been to swim lessons and sort of gradually got better and that was her best event was the swim no way yeah yeah she could, we couldn't believe it we couldn't believe it but uh i suppose if she, you know it's not an event as a crossfitter you necessarily prioritize a swimming event and she but. was doing swimming lessons and things to build her yeah yeah and she's yeah. fit obviously wasn't she yeah so. and, her, and her running actually so so she'd always like as she probably her gymnastics and her weightlifting were always pretty good um but her running and aerobic stuff wasn't wasn't quite as good so um but her running she worked on that a lot as well so i think i watched her so it was an assault course and it started with like a kilometer run before the assault course and i watched her and she she come around she was in the lead i was like what's going on calm down <laughs> pace yourself calm down a bit but oh, i'm all right i'm all right and then it, yeah and then she was on the assault course so it just i think it started to rain as she was on the assault course so like there was a finish with these monkey bars and she got about three, nearly the last two rungs on the monkey bars and then just dropped off sort of thing. And uh, you know, when you just want to be there and help someone through it and whatever, so she'd start again and whatever, but yeah, great, great experience. And like I say, probably like not as a, as a, as an individual, like it, it meant so 
much to her and it was great as a as a you know a box owner a friend and a coach to sort of see her dreams kind of materialize you know yeah amazing man yeah, yeah so cool yeah, yeah that's cool yeah, yeah that's really good cool. Hi guys, just a quick one. If you're enjoying this episode and have been enjoying our content and you're not subscribed, please click the link below and get subscribed. It really helps the channel. It allows us to get on really good guests and keep growing and bringing you more information. Um, so going back to the, the actual sort of workouts themselves then. So, because again, I, I can speak from like an outsider looking in. I love the type of training it is and I love watching it, but I've never actually really done much CrossFit and never sort of done much sort of structured workouts. And, and I think for some people, they would look at the style of training, the, the variation of the exercises you do. And certainly the CrossFit game, sometimes it just feels like, well, how can we just fucking mess with people? And they just throw this shit in there. But I think you mentioned earlier, it was like a, you called it a methodology. So what, what is the structure of, of sessions? And it, you know, how, how do you structure a session? Is it, is it underpinned with like specific science or how does that work? Can you explain yeah. that? So, like I said, the end goal is the general physical preparedness. So I think they call it the hopper, uh, you know, like a tombola. So if anything, any different manner of exercise or activity was to come out there, you go, yeah, I could I'd probably be all right at that. Now, our structure of how to get there is um, we as programmers, we need to sort of consider that we've got people that have been doing it for two weeks and people that have been doing it for sort of 10, 15 yeah. years. So we've got to allow for development at any stage. Okay, so we personally, we have three levels of our programming, health, fitness, and performance. They've all got the same stimulus, but they'll they'll differ in complexity, maybe, and, and certainly weights, maybe repetition ranges as well. Um, we, and most boxes will have this kind of structure. So you'll have a, You'll have a brief in and it will talk about the workout, the stimulus of the workout. We'll then have a warm up, which is like a quite a dynamic warm up, which is specific to the movements you're going to be doing on that day, as opposed to just a general kind of jumping jacks and press ups and this sort of thing. So it'll be quite specific to what's going to be that day. We we'll then typically have a part A, which is a strength or a skill element. Um, so they're quite calm, quite slow. Um, and it might be that we follow in some sort of cycle. So this is kind of typical to any strength protocol, maybe sort of some linear progression, and that might be working off of percentages of one rep maxes or RPEs. Um, so we're, we've, we help to try and get people quite in tune with rate of perceived exertion. So a 10 is this and a one's this, and this workout should be a six or a seven. Um, so they're kind of things that are probably just in any general strength and conditioning program um, so we found that cycles work quite well just because it gives people a chance to grow but also a chance to familiarize themselves with movements um, and you know like to, to gradually get better week by week and we also emphasize that you know getting better doesn't mean to say that your weight has to go up like doing something with the same weight um, better like more te technically better is still improvement um, and then we'll generate, so after that, and we try to get people to, as best we can, to sort of know their data. Um, I kind of use the expression, you've got to know, know your data to grow your data. Um, and that sort of like repels people some way or it's like, oh yeah, actually I'll write that down. Yeah, and when you say data, is that health data, lifting data? Just their, their performance, so whether the weight they did, the reps they did, how it fell, any technique sort of things that click for them today, just that sort of stuff. Um, then we'll have generally a part B. So that'll be normally a conditioning. So this is when we elevate the heart rate a bit. So, and it will vary in time from maybe intervals. So short and sharp, and we might sort of go two minutes on, one minute off. Um, and, and this is where the variance comes in because these are the variables that we play with. Uh, and we might draw in sort of a, it might be a heavy element with a conditioning element. So we might deadlift and run. Um, and it, I could go on and on and on because there's a hundred different movements and then you could put them into to sort of different things. But we'll generally do something that's been quite specific relating to part A. So if part A, for example, was a back squat, um, then part B might feature a thruster or wall balls. So we're already kind of warmed up. We're already in that. We've, we've got a head around that movement pattern. So then part B will kind of feature in that way. So that helps with the complexity in learning the movement. Um, 
and then we'll probably put in a low complexity movement and we've got ski ergs, we've got bikes, we've got rowers, we've got room to run, you know, and then you've got things like burpees and box jumps. I might put in that bracket as well and skip in. Uh, so then we'll put a low complexity movement in there as well. Um, and then we may put sort of a gymnastic movement in, which might have a skill element. So that might be handstand push up, uh, pull up or a rope climb or something like that. Um, and there'll be scaling options for everyone. And, you know, it's going to challenge the fittest and it's going to be achievable for the newest. Mm-hmm. Um, and we always like we make a big point of saying to people like in your first few months, I want you to leave this place feeling like you you could have done more. You could have lifted heavy. You could have gone faster. OK, because it's about literally building consistency um, and making this a habit. So if you leave here sort of on hands and knees, <laughs> like we're not going to see you again for a few days. And then that might just give you a bad, like a bad sort of experience kind of thing. So it is, it is very challenging to like keep challenging your more experienced guys, but also bringing in the newer guys, like 15 years worth of spectrum of people that, that, that do it, you know? And, you know, we don't know in an ideal world, you take a hundred people day one, you know, and then put them all through the same kind of progression yeah this is in the real world you just take them as they come and then you try and do the best of your ability yeah sort of thing so uh i can't remember what the question was but i'm sure we have uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, that, was, that was good it was how you should yeah. work out and what the, what the science oh, okay, is yeah. underpinning it so you got i think you said it part a part b um and, and what part where, where does olympic lifting come in because i think that's for me so i come from a sport rehab background um and for me, that's the most alarming bit when I look at CrossFit. Um, and I'd, it'd be good just to understand, I guess, the, the sort of reasoning for, for using Olympic lifting in CrossFit. Um, and then I guess the precautions that a good coach like yourself might use in regard to keeping people safe when yeah. doing that, because it's a very complex movement. And the science shows it's literally the most powerful movement in sport. Yeah. So can you explain that to us? Yeah, so I think Olympic lifting has its place in the respect of bringing together a few elements of um, skills within the fitness spectrum that w- w- normally the average person doesn't get to challenge. So accuracy, agility, coordination, balance. Um, you, you know, so I think Olympic lifting is is a perfect place to bring all those things together, um, particularly as well. Like once you get used to them. To, to harness power and speed. Um, so it is challenging and we, you know, once again, we would break it right the way down and offer sort of uh, levels ranging from like if, for example, you know, you've got two, two lifts, you've got a snatch and a clean and jerk. Um, so the snatch for a new a newer person, we might do a hang variant. So they just go from above their knees and then they'll do a hang muscle variant. So they just get used to extending at their ankle, their knee and at their hip and using the power that they create through that triple extension to elevate an object. In this case, normally a barbell or a PVC pipe or a broomstick in there, whatever it might be overhead and getting a feel for weightlessness on that, on that object. So it's, it's enabling them to get a relationship between kind of the big movers in your body and what they do. Mm. Okay. Um, and I think this is where CrossFit it becomes for people like a hobby really, because it's, it's just a new skill and it's, it, it I think sometimes we associate exercise with turning the brain off and getting it done. And I think this enables like this kind of movement, the more complex movements mean we have to turn the brain on big, big time and we become focused. We, we get a bodily awareness and um, we've also got opportunities for progression as well. And you can physically see, OK, I can do that from the hang. Now let me try it from below the knee. Let me try it with a dip underneath it. Let me try it with a little bit of load, you know, so you can physically take someone like you can progress them and they can see that progression. Um, so I think it doesn't hurt to have anyone try these things. Now, uh, if, for example, um, you do to, you know, going back to our good mechanics, first and foremost, consistency, then intensity mm-hmm. sort of flow, um, we've got to be careful getting the person to do the right thing at the right time. So that's, that, that is about us managing 
kind of people's uh, abilities and when you kind of then maybe take it okay so now someone has got the they have got the skill they have got you know they're a strong guy girl they're back fit back squats proficient their deadlifts proficient their power variant i.e their power snatch or their power clean is proficient you know their mechanics are good we're starting to tick 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 boxes now now we can because the way i see it olympic lifting is not such a isn't such a strength thing it's not like it's more bringing together lots of lots of elements and creating power and speed um so now it's more just a tactical thing so once once you can bring that all together and then and that's it's just the art of it really because you're then starting to film people and they're seeing what they look like under movement and you're sort of digesting this part of it and you go in a little bit too early there and it becomes i've I sort of associate it with like a golf swing mm -hmm. you know you can hit one that goes straight down the middle you know i.e you snatch one and it feels light and it feels great and you're like oh i've nailed it and then you hit one for no reason like in the woods you know and then that's the same with a barbell all of a sudden you do something slightly different and it just doesn't feel right so it kind of the, the olympic lifting side of it can grab you and um it, it, it's quite it's quite good because you can see you can grow your numbers within it it forces you to perhaps focus on your mobility work a little bit more um and it really does focus on you then getting stronger in your more kind of raw movements your squats your deadlifts and that sort of thing so i'd say in our environment people are only subjected to these movements when they're ready for them um and it, it is different obviously in a we normally would feature that sort of thing in a part a you know where it's we've got time it's calm you know, you've got a coach floating around, giving feedback, that sort of thing. And then when when and if it is in a workout, it really is generally a lighter load or light to moderate load. Um, and there's if you're at this level, you don't do that movement, you do this movement. So we'll kind of manage that. I think where the danger lies, I was thinking about this earlier, actually, is... Um, Say, for example, you know, you're, you you go to a gym and it's got a functional training area and you want to do CrossFit and you, you look at these movements and you try and give them a go. Like you're going into an area that you haven't got a coach and you, you, you're, not, you're going straight for the big movement rather than breaking it right down. So you're, you're there trying to, and I was that person originally, you know, like trying to see what it looked like on YouTube. And then, because we didn't have smartphones at the time, then go and try and replicate that at the gym. At least now you can watch it and try and do it. But I'm, I sort of think whether people try stuff in that functional training area of a normal gym and everyone's like, look at that fucking idiot. You know, like, what the hell is he doing? You know, that <laughs> yeah. that yeah. just looks crazy, that fucking CrossFit idiot. You know, and I think that's where this rep, come, a lot of this rep comes from because you see your general gym goer. And then you see your CrossFit. <laughs> seeing, and it, it, I don't think it works. I don't think it works. I think you've got functional training areas in gyms and I think that's, there never used to be those, I don't think. There used to be a studio, there used to be a weight area, there used to be a cardio area. CrossFit came along, and then over time, you've seen more functional training areas. Now, initially, they were great for PTs because I'm like, fucking great, I've got all this space now, I can train my clients in. And they were the only ones who used it, and clients felt comfortable because their PT was guiding them through what to do. You know, nowadays, when I see someone, like, if I, even if they're skipping or flipping a tire or doing battle ropes, it's so noisy and compared, like, everything else is like, dink 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 and there's this bang 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 and you're like okay, look at that idiot you know likewise in a crossfit gym someone stood in the corner doing bicep curls looks a bit weird as well you know so each place has its place kind of thing so um yeah i think i i as long as the technique is maintained and when you start to increase your heart rate you know and you're efficient and your fatigue creeps in there is potential for the movement mechanics to break down a little bit that's exactly the only thing i was about to say that's the only thing yeah. that i think with that is yeah. if you're deadlifting and then you're tired from a run you come in and then that form shit yeah. that's the only issue yeah. that's the only issue with it yeah. and, and whether then, it's then right then or wrong is is again yeah. technique and and you as a person if you let your ego get above you and not take that rest that you probably fucking need yeah. you know and and yeah, this is the, i think as well the biggest opportunity for sports people because normally in your game or your sport the important time is 
the last 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Most people are good at their sport tactically at the start. Technically, they're good. Start to add fatigue in and then that can break down a little bit. So if you have the capacity to maintain good form and technique under fatigue, you know, and you're used to doing that on a daily basis, it's second nature. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a huge, tr that's where a big opportunity lies for this kind of thing it, to trade off into the world of sport. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, you made some really good good points there, mate. And I think, um, yeah, I think you're spot on most of that. I think, I think, yeah, I think people compare it to walking on a treadmill and, and, and sitting on a cross trainer. And it's not, you know, you have, <laughs> to look at it, you have to look at it as a sport and it's, you know, as you say, there's a skill acquisition involved with that sport and it's very technical. And I think you, you throw a, a non-sports person into any sport, you know, you get, you get somebody kicking a ball around, trying to do a sort of high velocity change of direction. Yeah. They're probably going to blow their knee out unless they build up to that you get someone in jiu-jitsu doing a I don't know shooting a double leg they're probably going to injure themselves so I think it's yeah it's a really fair point but you also mentioned about how the biggest risk sort of lies with people just doing it themselves and I think you're right I think the CrossFit's influence I think the normal gym space massively isn't it and even you know I, I, I work for a, a commercial gym and even going back maybe five years ago, they started introducing these functional areas and it was literally to compete with like your little boutique gyms in London and the CrossFit boxes. And now you will have like personal trainers that maybe don't have a sound understanding of, of you know, sort of Olympic lifting, um, yeah. you know, or just members, as you say, seeing on TV going in and, and doing mad stuff. And that's probably where you see the injuries. Well, I think that's what happens, isn't it? I think that's what happens, especially with personal trainers. They, they might, not a lot of personal trainers from my experience don't know how to olympic olympic lift mm -hmm. so then i was quite lucky that i'd done crossfit and that did give me a really good really good understanding of all olympic lifts but i think if i didn't do that I'm not saying like I, I knew how to deadlift and stuff but it's more the more technical ones to snatch the, the, well, you, the you clean need to, you need to better coach it as a, as a personal exactly, trainer as well so yeah. you can't even just be able to do it you need to, yeah. to coach somebody through the various points and that's it. it isn't it and then and then like you said you've got even personal trainers just showing people kind of crossfit-y workouts and moves but they're, they're they don't even understand the movement the hinge movement properly they don't understand the where it comes from you know it's a, it's a tricky one because you get went to to develop and improve your olympic lifts you have got to start working percentages like and you get to a point and you're you're stood there coaching a class and you're saying right today we're going to do 67 percent of your one rm and we're going to go for it we're going to do a hang squat snatch today and people are kind of we've got a blur <laughs> look at you, you know a what's a snatch b i don't know my one rm c what's the hang position and you're like oh we've gone down a bit of a olympic lifting rabbit hole here haven't we you know so it is once again it's that it's tricky, you know, it's tricky to sort of, um, you still touch upon it, but you don't want it to be at the be and end all. But if you don't do it frequently, then you, you're not going to know these numbers. But and I, and I think this is where CrossFit as a, we've got to remind ourselves that CrossFit is a training methodology and it's also a sport as well. Like, and as a sport, you need to know, you need to be prepared for anything that might come up. As a training methodology, do you need to do that? Not necessarily. Like if you can snatch a dumbbell, like if you can snatch a dumbbell overhead or, or or jump on a box, that's still a triple extension. So it's the same sort of thing. So this is where we bring it right the way up or right the way back down, you know, sort of thing. So yeah, no, that's good. And and that level of coaching does that does that attribute a little bit to the price? Because I think CrossFit gyms are typically a bit more expensive, aren't they, than, than normal gyms? Yeah, they are. Diff totally different product. Totally different product. So a gym's a facility, you know, and it could be best facility in the world, you know. Um, but it's still somewhere you go and train. Um, so I, I break it down into four sections, really. So at a CrossFit gym, you've got the facility, and that is important because you can't really do CrossFit that effectively in a normal gym, even though it's got a functional training area. Like you put down a rower, someone nicks your rower. You know, <laughs> like you, you put certain weights on your bar, someone nicks your bar, and a, then you start getting looked at in a funny way. So facility is quite important really and our like i say our gym five thousand square foot for a hundred hundred foot rig it's it's beautiful it's fantastic it's a really good good place to train um you've then got the coaching side of things so um you know every session is coached uh you're looked after no matter what level or ability you're at our coach is there to educate entertain and inspire people um you, you know then we've got the programming 
So we'll like CrossFit's a bit jigsaw puzzle like, so we'll bring together all the pieces of the jigsaw, put them together. And then we've got the community side of things as well. Uh, so like-minded people doing doing that. So you've got four different things there as part of the product. Now, the facility, like, I don't know, take it, if, if you'd pay how much value you would put on each one. So a regular gym might be anywhere between 20 and 70 quid, say, for example. So we've got a facility. So say that's 20 quid going low end. So you've got pro uh, coaching, like every session that you go, um, you know, maybe you'd normally pay a personal tra personal training session. What's that, Danny or PT? So at 35 quid, something like that. All right. So say that's 20 quid for the month, like for all of your sessions. We've got a capacity of like 14 people in a class. So you're always going to get a decent bit of, of attention. You know, they've got, you've got your program in, you could outsource the program in like to someone and you might pay anywhere between 20 and 50 quid for that. You know, and then you've got the community side of things and you can't, I don't think you can put a price on that anyway. So, between all of those things, if each of that's 20, you've got 80 quid there. You know, I, I think as represents very good value. It is it is very much a different sort of product to a, a typical kind of gym, really. When you start layering on all of the other things, um, I think I just think it's great value. And, and also we're, you know, we run off of lower numbers. So we'll have our sort of sweet spots around 150 because then we can maintain good relationships with, 150 people that's you know we know their name we know their occupation we know their lifestyle we know kind of when they're going on holiday you know if they get married soon or whatever we know a bit about them we're not just saying hello and goodbye you know it's it's about sort of creating a relationship and helping people through their sort of fitness journey if you like so i, I think yeah. people when they when you get into crossfit one of the best things about going to crossfit is just turning up and then you it's all everything's taken care of yeah so those people out there are like don't uh don't know what they're doing in the gym or whatever if you if you do join a crossfit box you just you just fucking have to get there do you know what i mean that's the biggest thing even if i was tired or if i was feeling oh, i can't be fucked today but you just get there and then you see all your mates and then you're like oh fuck it yeah we're in we're in anyway yeah and that's but it and then you just it's the on the board and you're, yeah. and you're doing it get, and you get your foot in the door then that's we'll, it then we'll and start taking a piss out yeah <laughs> that's it isn't it though it's it's that thing you don't have to think you do not have to think you just turn up do you, your programming's ready and you just fucking go, you know? Um, it's the same with personal training, isn't it? That's why people have personal trainers, you know? It's a bit more bespoke for personal fatigue, training, mate. but exactly. People who've got the money or got the ambition to do better, having something like that where they don't have, even have to think. They just come, boom, do, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely reassurance. Like, we, you know, and I think particularly if I sort of picture our average member, you know, they've got kids and a mortgage and a business and... You know, they're all day making decisions, yeah. you know, to come in somewhere just to be told what to do for a bit. It's refreshing. And then actually focus on what they're doing, like not, you know, that's an escape. So, you know, we all perhaps get that in different ways. You guys might do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You know, I used to race motorbikes, you know, as soon as I put my helmet on, my goggles on, I don't think of anything else, you know. And you need that. You need that to refresh, you know, mentally. So if you're getting that, like, on a daily basis, I think it's quite... Uh, it's quite an important yeah, it's thing really, really important. You know? yeah definitely yeah. yeah I wanted to touch on mental health because obviously we opened up a little bit with it and you know I think we've throughout this conversation we've we've touched on the community and and, and many things that I think would attribute to, to positive mental health in in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu we've talked about this I've been around the scene for years and I've seen so many people walk in the door almost a shell of a human and through community through school acquisition through confidence of of just flourished and become these completely different people. Mm. Do you tend to see that in CrossFit as well? Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, coming in, everyone's a bit overwhelmed to start with because it's a it's all new. You know, it's a big big place, and gradually gain their confidence. Gradually gain, you know, the ability to bite back a little bit when we're out, we're having a bit of a laugh and a bit of banter. Um, but just when people like particularly, I don't know, it sounds stereotypical, but more so as girls' strength numbers grow and stuff like that. And, and I think there's something with strength and confidence is just linked hand to hand and it's just starting to see what you're being aware of, what your body can do, exploring what your body's capable of. Um, like from a performance perspective, it's exciting, you know, like, fuck oh, on, if I can do that much in three months, what can I do in like three years? That exploring that, is really refreshing and I think 
there's a lot to be said for looking forward as opposed to kind of, you know, looking back. If you get to a point in your life where I used to play football or I used to go to, I used to be fit and then I had kids and then I had this and then I have a, it's quite a, like you're almost throwing the towel in, you know, like it's, so just to be still looking, doing the best in what you could be doing and looking forward, positivity is like essential, I think, to have a, like a, a healthy mindset you know it's quite humbling as well because you can go in there thinking that you're fit you know what I mean and then you realise no I'm not fit same with jiu-jitsu you know you, it's, it's so similar the two things at times because you know they you go in there and even like again when I was playing football I went in there and I was like oh I'm fairly fit you know I can run <laughs> and then you go into a, you know I can lift some weights I can do my isolation exercises whatever and then you go into CrossFit and you're like fuck me like every single person in this box would smash me fitness wise you know and then you get talking and then once you get fitter then you realise ah oh, you know if someone did come in off the street I think we talked about it a few times you know, someone come off the street and they come in and they think they're fit they're not fit does that make sense compared to someone who does CrossFit regularly? Yeah. Mm. And it's the same, obviously, with jiu-jitsu. If, if a regular bloke comes in off the street to grapple with someone, say you, you've never done jiu-jitsu, have you? No. Like, you're, you're a really fit guy, but if you were to get on the mats with a 60-kilo blue belt, he would, he would twist you up. There's, just, no two, just, there's no two ways yeah, about just, it, you know, no matter how strong you are. And yeah, it's, it's, it's the sport-specific efficiencies, though, isn't it, that you develop it, with the yeah. skill acquisition as well, I think. I think you touched on this earlier as well, I wanted to ask. What, what's the longevity of CrossFit? Is it something that you can do into your 40s, 50s? Yeah, I think if you're attuned with yourself and your capabilities and sort of like like we're, you know, when you hit your 40s and 50s, things change hormonally and like lifestyle changes. I've been doing it 15 years, 16 years now. And, you know, like I said, when I started, I was late late 20s, early 30s and, and competition and challenge was the be all and end all to me. Um, when I had my son, you know, like that throws your world <laughs> upside down. Yeah, your pro there, priorities yeah. change. So, so I'd, I'd, I'd always said that because I was always told that I, as a kid, just sort of slotted in and, you know, my mum and dad said, oh, you're no bother. And we just used to take you, drag you around wherever we went. So in my mind's eye, well, that's what a kid does. You know? <laughs> Fuck, I, I, was, I was wrong. I was wrong <laughs> about that. So, yeah, it, I, so I tried to sort of keep going, training two, three times a day or whatever. And, something's got to give you know you start less sleep and nutrition habits aren't quite so good and whatever else so that was a bit of a that was a bit of a wake-up call really having my first child and then um so I just accepted that CrossFit now for me was a way of just keeping healthy and and, and I thought yep I can continue to do this and when we went to the games actually um the over 60 category was the most inspiring category I there can, like imagine, yeah. they're just basically Adonises with, you know, <laughs> a, gr a, a grey head plonked on, <laughs> yeah, their, plonked yeah. on their bodies. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, super inspiring. And you think, yeah, this is it's possible to do this. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I think as long as you're, as long as you're in an environment that is flexible, like, you know, because we're, if you do pick up a, a niggle or an injury or whatever else, you know, if you're in an environment which is relaxed to say, right, okay, well, these are our other options, you know, and we can work around this because, you, you know, in, in any activity, you do pick up bits and bobs, you know, like um, if you're a runner, you pick up bits. So you, it's part and parcel of being active, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, um, you, can't, you can't not get injuries on anything. No, I really, think so. And, and I, that's all part of the journey is that you maybe realise then, oh, okay, that tells me I need to be like doing a little bit more mobility work or or something um i think as as from my perspective as we evolve and if i do get any niggles or whatever i do sort of tend to to go back to a little bit more isolation work and we sort of talked about that a bit earlier so i do i come back from it to then be able to get back into it so if i've got that process that i can always kind of fall in and out of um as a coach do you look at people overtraining so like from a crossfit plymouth point of view i know with my pt clients if i think someone is just doing too much and they're, they're not really benefiting yeah. from it do you pull people up because yeah. i know how addictive crossfit can yeah. be and you've, you've, you know people can overtrain they can get certain illnesses and you know mm -hmm. obviously injuries bad bad backs and all sorts of stuff so yeah how do you how do you manage that so it can be 
like particularly if you've got a competitive nature, like it can be a, a place where you'll just drive yourself into the ground, you know, like every day has got every day is a competition. You know, like I've got to beat so and so, I've got to beat so and so. And, you know, this is where we as coaches again, it's, it's training guys, not sport. You know, if you want to compete, there's an opportunity for you to compete, etc. So it's just education that today's RPE is seven. You know, today's a bit more of a recovery day because we did this and this yesterday and so on and so forth. Um, today's an RPE of nine. You know, we're going to go for it. However, if you feel a bit drained because you've, you know, just go at whatever suits you it's your workout you know so there is going to be if you don't listen to any of that you know yeah. and then if you just get the blinkers on and go for it every single time then yeah it's a, it's it's going to come to a point where you, you know you know your immune system's going to take a bit of a beating you start to pick up colds and then you're not going to be so healthy and um you know they m might pick up niggles and the trouble is when you start picking up niggles and you're like, well, I've got this competition I entered next next month. You know, what do I do? Do I? Oh, I'll go for it anyway. So you just train through the niggles. Then you're at the competition. You can't feel the niggles when you're at the comp because your adrenaline's just kicking in. And then it's, you get back to it on Tuesday. And you're like, fucking hell, my shoulder's killing me. I really should do something about it. But I, but I love this workout. I love the look of this workout today. <laughs> and then you yeah, just I, carry on for I it. see that one. I didn't feel too bad once I got going, you know. And then, so you, I think it's just having paying your body some respect really and just sort of treating it as a bit of um like a precious thing in some respects and looking after it and kind of the the, the methodology is pretty solid um, but it doesn't mean to say that you can't put elements of sort of uh time under tension and some hypertrophy training in there some good mobility work in there go go and do some yoga get out of that environment for a bit do something else come back to it you know so um i think the key is for me or for most people for fitness it's got to be a long game because you can't bank it so you know you've got to uh, figure out what's going to serve you well over the course of time you know so yeah amazing and if someone was watching this and and still kind of slightly on the fence about starting crossfit what would you say to them um well you, you don't know until you've tried it i suppose and uh i'd say most crossfit gyms will will allow you to do whether it's a a trial session i'm not a big believer in a trial session because you've got so many different movements so many different styles of workout we personally do a two-week trial um once again is that long enough i don't know but it just gives you people a bit of a chance to get an idea of the facility get a feel for that whether it's the sort of vibe that they enjoy training in um get a feel for the programming coaching community um so I, I, if you're going to give it a go you've got to give it a chance like you're not going to get results in two weeks um so all that's done is giving you a chance to sort of like check it out and see whether it, it's somewhere you want to spend a lot of time so if you're going to give it a go i'd say three months for three three times a week you know uh and then just the, the results are gonna we're gonna happen um and then and then sort of go from there really it's either going to grab you or you might just think well it was okay i can see the benefit but i prefer what i'm doing and at the end of the day like whatever you enjoy doing and keep consistent at is the best way you know whether that's you know sport that you play or you know bodybuilding or yoga whatever you can consistently do is the best way isn't it so yeah 100 yeah. percent. and if people are locally based in plymouth where do they find you so we are at Faraday Mill, um, next to KF Kitchens, give them a bit of a plug as well. Um, not too far, about 200 metres from the Go Outdoors building, most people know that. Um, so yeah, we're sort of smack bang. We're just on the periphery of the city centre, 5,000 square foot unit, a little bit of parking outside. Um, yeah, just to give it, drop us a, a message on our viral website, crossfitplymouth.com. Um, and then we'll get in touch with you. When you do your two week trial, we, we, we we work with you a lot, you know, with hours of session, you know, we make sure we meet you there and we show you around the building and just kind of give you a chance to settle in. And then uh, hopefully if you like it and want to want to crack on, then we'll, we'll we'll sign you up sort of thing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Cool. You got any other questions? No, mate, it's all good. Anything else you want to plug, buddy? No, I think we're, we're all good. Yeah, mate, I've done a lot today. Thank you, mate. Appreciate the conversation. Thanks for coming on. Cheers, mate. Cool. Thank you. Cheers.